Okay. We are recording and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone, and anyone who will watch this in the future. Um, my name is Colin Dobson, and I tonight we have a one of our 2022 Kinde Grant recipients, Sarah Studer, Stewart, who recently defended her thesis in Michael Ward's lab here with, through NRES uh, on the University of Illinois campus. And she will be talking about her work with Eastern Whippoorwills. Just very quickly, we have a few things coming up. Um, we have our Sunday morning bird walks that will continue throughout the month of April and into May, as uh, Roger and I were just talking about. We had a big turnout the last two weekends, uh, around 30 or 35, two weekends ago. We had about 40 or 45 people last Sunday. So we're looking forward to seeing anyone in the future. Um, the few volunteer days coming up, we got the Boneyard Community uh, Creek Community, sorry, Boneyard Creek Community Day on April 22nd around 9 a.m. starting at the Anita, Anita Purvis Nature Center. The planning day with planting day with an um no designated time at the current time uh, at the current time through the Urbana Park District, also at Anita Purvis. And then also with the International Dark Sky Week celebration on Saturday, the 22nd from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. at Middle Fork, just northeast of Champaign. Uh, we also may have a couple field trips in May coming up as well, um, but those will be um, sent, information for those will be sent out um, via um, the next newsletter or on our website or on Facebook. And then also, I was just reminded by Beth Chato today that the spring bird count is on May 6th. So if you have any um, interest in helping out with that, please contact either us through Audubon or Beth Chato. So anyways, that is all of the announcements for the moment, and I'll give it off to Sarah for tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Um, as Colin said, um, my name is Sarah Stewart. And tonight I'll be presenting my research on the post-fledging ecology of the Eastern Whippoorwill. Um, Again, as mentioned, this study was part of my master's thesis at the University of Illinois, um, uh, where I attended from spring of 2021 to early this year. Um, I am now currently working for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources as an avian biologist, um, where I'm actually assisting in monitoring and recovery efforts for the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. Um, so if anyone has burning questions about RCWs as well, um, feel free to ask me those. Um, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, but it's great to have an opportunity to talk about whippoorwills again, so I hope you enjoy. So before I begin, um, I'd like to express my gratitude to Champaign County Audubon Society for your generosity and for giving me the honor of being a Kindy Grant recipient. Um, this is a really great program and the impact you all have had on young researchers in Illinois, including myself, really can't be understated. So thank you very much. <clears throat> So I wanna start out by defining what a fledgling is and how we designate this specific life stage. So I'm sure many of you have already seen this infographic circulate on Facebook before. Um, it just shows a lot of common pastoring species in their fledgling stage. Um, so chicks become fledglings um, in the moment that they leave the safety of the nest for the first time. Um, but as you can see from these photos, they still haven't molted into their juvenile or adult plumage and often can't fly or feed themselves for at least a few days after they fledge. Um, these young birds are still heavily reliant on their parents for food, but they quickly grow into their flight feathers and are soon able to fly and feed themselves. So we consider a bird to be in its post-fledging stage from this really vulnerable period directly after they leave the nest all the way until um, they depart from their parents' territory. And we often think of fledgling ecology within a sort of altricial development framework. So where baby birds come out of the egg really helpless um, and naked and rely entirely on adults to meet their provisional needs, um, even past the point of fledging. Um, however, it's important to note that the post-fledging period looks very different for species employing other developmental strategies. 
So for example, precocial offspring um, like the Canada goose um, are very mobile and can even forage for food directly after hatching. Um, but the point of fledging is defined by their first flight, which can be weeks or months past their hatch date. So birds can face very different challenges during their post-fledging period based on these aspects of their development. So why is studying the post-fledging period important? Why are we interested in this life stage? So as I hinted before, um, fledgling birds are uniquely vulnerable to predation and exposure um, due to their inexperience outside of the nest and often conspicuous behavior when they beg for food. Um, in passerines, mortality often peaks um, during the first two weeks um, after they leave the nest, um, but survival rates generally stabilize, oops, sorry, generally stabilize um, over the course of the post-fledging period. Uh, however, this sharp initial drop in survival can greatly reduce the number of potential um, recruits to a bird population. So identifying some of these species-specific sources of mortality during the post-fledging stage as well as understanding the overall impact of fledgling survival on measures of breeding success is important context for conservation, especially for declining or understudied species. So measures of breeding success um, are an indicator of population status that are used in a lot of um, avian research studies, but a lot of times these studies will end after the chicks leave the nest, um, leaving fledgling survival and fledgling behavior as a sort of unknown but pretty critical parameter. Um, thankfully, this has been changing over the last 10 to 15 years um, with the advent of lighter and longer lasting radio tags um, that allow biologists and researchers to continue to reliably monitor young birds even after they leave the nest. And so this brings me to my study species, the Eastern Whippoorwill. Um, the Whippoorwill is one of the most charismatic yet understudied breeding birds in North America. And this includes a lack of knowledge on their post-fledging ecology. So the Whippoorwill's appearance and behavior is primarily to blame for this. Um, they have really cryptic plumage to conceal themselves while they roost on the ground or on a perch. Um, they're also primarily active um, during crepuscular periods or um, at dawn and dusk um, when they forage for moths. So even though they and their song are often a fixture of rural America, or, you know, thought of as a fixture, um, because of their cryptic coloration and kind of, um, you know, nocturnal uh, activity patterns, um, they are rarely observed, um, even if they're heard. Uh, unfortunately, um, Whippoorwills are experiencing rapid population declines throughout their range, so there's essentially a, like a race against time to sort of pinpoint these primary drivers um, for this decline. In addition to their activity patterns, um, Whippoorwills exhibit breeding behavior that is really unique um, among North American forest birds. So they lay to egg clutches directly on the ground, um, often in leaf litter, um, with both male and female parents concealing eggs during incubation with just their plumage um, instead of building any sort of defined nest structure. Um, this species follows a semi-precocial uh, development strategy. Um, so chicks are down covered and mobile soon after hatching and young will often then move further and further away from the original nest site with age. They are, however, completely reliant on adults for food and even thermoregulation for their first couple weeks of life. Um, we consider whippoorwill young to be of fledging age once they can reliably fly short distances um, at approximately 15 days old. But as you can imagine, there's no real departure from a nest because there is no nest, um, like we see with copper cavity nesting species. Um, but adults will still provision and brood young for an additional two to three weeks past um, the point where they can fly. So beyond these sort of incidental observations about extended parental care in whippoorwills, we really don't know much about their post-fledging ecology, 
much less um, have estimates of fledgling survival. Um, additionally, whippoorwills um, don't fit into altricial or precocial groupings. They're sort of in the middle, this semi-precocial development strategy. Um, and it makes it difficult for us to make predictions about this, what this life stage might look like for them. So with this study, I sought to describe post-fledging behavior of whippoorwills and estimate survival rates during the 30 days post-fledging. So having empirically derived survival rates will you know, improve accuracy of population, population growth estimates for whippoorwills. It can provide context to the severity of their decline and potentially highlight any conservation concerns within this life stage. And for whippoorwills, um, estimating survival definitely becomes challenging once chicks become mobile and exhibit lower association with the original nest site. Um, but using radio tags um, to monitor individual fledglings extends that observation period and allows for these post-fledging survival rates to be estimated. So from 2019 to 2022, we conducted nest searching and monitoring for whippoorwills between May and July at two sites in Mason County, Illinois, um, Sandridge State Forest um, on the top and Sand Prairie Scrub Oak Nature Preserve on the bottom. Um, both of these sites have a mix of open and forested habitats with some early successional scrub habitats that whippoorwills will often forage and nest in. We conducted nocturnal nest searching by locating the eye shine of incubating or brooding adults, um, which is visible when the light from a headlamp that we're wearing as we're searching hits the tapetum lucidum in their eye. And the tapetum lucidum is the, the structure in the, in the eye that allows them to see in these like low light conditions during dusk and dawn when they're foraging. So if we found a nest, we would flag its location and then return every two to five days to monitor its development. And so we would do this either until a nest failed, which was often the full disappearance of eggs or chicks, or it fledged. So in 2019 and 2020, um, before I joined the project, there was an emphasis on VHF tagging adults. So we were able to monitor, monitor the development of young post fledge as long as they were still associated with a tagged parent. But when I joined, I wanted to be able to relocate fledglings after they were no longer receiving parental care. So I VHF tagged young birds directly um, in 2021 and 2022. So when chicks reached fledging age, I would relocate them and capture them by hand um, for banding and tagging. Um, I tag birds from 13 to 19 days old, depending on how easy they were to capture. And sometimes just whenever I could get lucky, um, capturing fledglings and finding them to capture was definitely difficult at times. Um, and sometimes they would just flush and disappear into the night and I would never see them again um, if we weren't careful with our approach. So I just tagged all the ones I could get my hands on. Um, and so when we were able to um, find these fledglings, I attached um, a really small radio transmitter directly to their back. Um, actually with a combination of Revlon Lash Glue and Super Glue, if you can believe it. Um, and to further improve tag retention, I threaded a small square of a, like a cheesecloth or like a canvas type fabric um, to the back of the transmitter, which increased surface area once it um, was adhered to the skin. And so I relocated tag fledglings um, five to six times per week after they were tagged um, using handheld telemetry equipment. And so when I was able to relocate a bird, I recorded its location, its behavior, whether it was um, found with an adult um, in any instances of predation or tag loss. And so um, to calculate fledgling survival during those 30 days post-fledging, I actually used this relocation data to um, excuse me, <clears throat> to run a set of models. Um, and I'll save you the minute, save you from the minutia of the analysis, but 
I would like to distinguish what the output of these models are um, as I'll be referencing them in my results. So I first estimated daily survival rate, which is the probability that an individual fledgling will um, survive from one day to the next. And with these daily rates, I was able to calculate cumulative survival, which is the probability of a fledgling surviving within a longer time interval. And so the time interval that I was interested in was those 30 days post-fledging. I want to begin discussing the results of this study by covering some basic life history knowledge um, that I gained from my fledgling monitoring. So as I mentioned earlier, we use VHF tags to either track adults with fledglings or the fledglings themselves. And we ended up monitoring 33 fledglings through association with a tag parent or sibling across all years. And then I tagged another 18 fledglings between 2021 and 2022. So due to tag loss or mortality, I was only able to observe 12 fledglings after they became independent from their parents. Uh, and I confirmed four instances of predation of those 18 tagged fledglings. And I do suspect that these were all because of avian predators, um, specifically owls, um, based on the state of remains um, or by actually tracking transmitters directly to owl nests. Um, and so here, I have a basic timeline of the 30 days post-fledging split into three phases. Um, this first phase is what I call the parental care phase. Uh, adults will continue to brood and provision young for an additional two or more weeks after fledglings will able to, are able to fly. So typically only one parent will care for fledglings. And in a lot of cases, this is the male parent so that the female can actually make a second nesting attempt, um, what we call a second brood. Um, however, I did observe instances where they stayed with the female parent, or in one case with both parents. So each parent got one fledgling to take care of, which was, I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so although fledglings can fly at this stage, they are unskilled and, and to my knowledge have not yet attempted to forage. Uh, the next phase is the transition phase, um, and that's exactly what it sounds like. It's during this time that fledglings begin to forage for themselves and separate from adults. Um, so first foraging attempts that I observed occurred um, as early as 25 days old, um, but there's likely overlap between parental care and these attempts as they sort of make that transition to independence. Um, I observed three out of our four predations during this time, which makes sense as fledglings are likely more conspicuous and less skilled at evading predators when they first begin to forage on their own. And finally, we have independence. So fledglings begin to forage and roost without adults. And something interesting that I notice is that um, if both fledglings and the brood reach independence, they'll often forage and roost together even after leaving their parents. Uh, there were some times when I would see them sallying from the same tree, um, catching moths, um, which is such a treat to see. It was so cool. Um, they really start to look and act like adults when they, once they get past 40 days old. And in terms of predations, I did not observe any predations of fledglings older than 35 days old. So none into independence um, once we get past that transition phase. So there were 48 individual fledglings um, that I considered in my um, survival analysis. Um, the cumulative probability um, or cumulative survival um, in the first 30 days post-fledgling was 96%. So a fledgling was 96% likely to reach 45 days of age, um, which is almost shockingly high um, when you compare that to moderate or low post-fledging survival that we often see in passerines, so those cup and cavity nesting species. I expected fledgling survival to be lowest at these intermediate or transition ages, um, since I observed a majority of our predation events when fledglings were losing their association with adults. However, um, this graph, which has daily survival estimates on the y-axis and fledgling age on the x-axis, 
Um, you can see this downward trend begin um, around day 30, um, but then continue downwards with really large confidence intervals. And this really just emphasizes that although I did not observe any predations in flood chains older than 35 days old, it doesn't mean that this does not occur. However, based on my observations in the field, I do suspect that survival levels off at older ages and doesn't just continue downwards like that with age. So fledglings of cup and cavity nesting species, as I mentioned before, experience a pulse in mortality directly after they leave the nest due to an increase in predation and exposure risk. So while whippoorwill fledglings don't leave a physical nest structure or the protection of adults on their fledge date, they do appear to undergo a similar transition later in their development where their experience as they begin to forage independently puts them at risk of those owl attacks. And to put these results into context, here I have cumulative survival of eggs during the 20-day incubation phase and cumulative survival of chicks during the 15 days post-hatch compared to that really high survival um, during the post-fledging phase that we observed. And so as you can see, fledging survival is really quite high compared to both egg and chick survival. Um, eggs um, appear to be the most vulnerable to predators having only the cryptic plumage of adults to protect them while chicks are moderately less vulnerable due to their own cryptic coloration and ability to move short distances um, if disturbed. But fledgings really are the least vulnerable in this context because they have both that cryptic plumage that's similar to the adults and they can fly away from the ground predators that are often predating these um, eggs and chicks. And so behavior by parents likely has a substantial impact on preparing these fledglings for independence um, they're essentially providing an extended chick rearing period where they're not only provisioning fledglings, but actually physically brooding them um, up to three weeks past their fledge date. And this likely improves the probability that fledglings not only will not only survive up until independence, um, but past independence as well. At least I, that's what I suspect. So how can this knowledge of whippoorwill fledgling ecology inform our understanding of the species population decline and conservation needs? So although we see that fledglings do become more vulnerable once they become independent from their parents, the impact of this behavioral transition does not prevent overall survival, overall fledgling survival from staying elevated, um, which may not be the case for um, fledglings that are much less developed um, on their fledge date. <clears throat> uh, this high fledgling survival that we observed and the parental behavior that underlies it may actually help bolster the number of recruits or birds entering the population um, when survival of these more vulnerable egg and chick stages is low or variable between years. So Whippoorwill clients um, likely don't stem um, from the post-fledging life stage, at least not entirely, um, but this points us more clearly in the direction of nest mortality as potentially impacting population dynamics. So much more study is needed to identify things like nest predators um, and when specific nest predators are um, selecting eggs or chicks to feed on as well as temporal and spatial patterns in predation risk. So before I end the presentation, I would like to acknowledge my advisors, Mike Ward and TJ Benson, for giving me the opportunity to conduct this research, as well as to Ian Souza Cole, who was the former master's student on the Whipper Roll project and who collected all of the 2019 and 2020 data that I used for this study. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our field assistants, uh, Illinois DNR for allowing us access to our study sites, and then once again to Champaign County Audubon um, for the honor of a Kennedy grant and for supporting this project. Thank um, you so and much, Sarah. Now I'll sorry. open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, great presentation. Mm -hmm. I did learn a couple new things, but... Um, <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> Um, but I will say that that presentation and also since I'd never said it before, your defense was very good. So I had the luck, I had the pleasure to see Sarah pre present 
um, her difference with the, this and then her other tap chapter. So anyways, that Thank was you, great. Colin. I appreciate that. That was great. And we'll open up to any questions. I'll stop recording real quick, but we'll open up to questions.